Please rise. We join together in the prayer of the day. Almighty God, look with loving mercy on your family for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, to be given over to the hands of sinners, and to suffer death on the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever and ever. Amen. Our reading today is from Isaiah 52 and 53. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For, they, for that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their faces. He was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, and yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? And he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light, he shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I 
crucified thee. Lo, the good shepherd, for the sheep is offered, the slave hath sinned, and the son hath suffered for our atonement, while we nothing heeded, God interceded. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Is it finished? Three times this morning I will ask this question. According to the Gospel of John, as we are about to hear in a moment, it definitely is finished. Jesus' life is over. Our Lord even says the words himself, it is finished. But words aren't enough. In case there's any doubt, a soldier pierces his side, Jesus' body is taken down and anointed with over a hundred pounds of burial cream. To make the point, it is finished. Wrapped in the traditional burial shroud, there is a new tomb set aside for the body. He is taken there to lie with all the other dead people. The way the story is told, there can be no doubt in anyone's mind, no doubt at all, that it is finished. Jesus is dead. Yes, thousands of people die every day. Many people die just as horribly as this man on the cross did so long ago. And yet it is this man's story that we return to every year. The story of this man's death is the most well-known, most repeated, most retold story in history. Why must we rehear it again and again? Because we have attached new meaning to this death. New meaning to these last three words, it is finished. We've looked back on these words for over 2,000 years and we have come to believe that when Jesus said it is finished, it was much more than saying this is my last breath. I finished living. Much more than my pulse has stopped. Much more than my heart is no longer beating. No, we who follow this crucified man believe that it is finished means, in fact, it is complete. It is fulfilled. And Jesus' whole life on earth is complete. His mission is fulfilled. His job is done. The thing that he came to earth to accomplish is complete and fulfilled. We've heard said that when this man died, he was carrying the weight of all human sin on his back. Not only, not only that, but even more, we have also heard, we've also said that when this man died, he became sin for us. We have also said that when this man died, he was paying the penalty for us. He was taking our place. We have also said that when this man died, the gap between God and humanity was bridged we have also said that when this man died, we were made clean and forgiven and adopted into God's family. And so for the second time this morning, I asked the question, is it finished? For 2,000 years, the church has said, yes, it is. This dying man on the cross has made us right with God. The cross completed the circle. The cross brings us home for good. Is it finished? Here is that question again. Is it complete? Is it fulfilled? Is it enough? The second time I ask. We teach that the cross is enough. We read it in our Bible. I preach about it. We say it in our prayers. We sing it in our hymns. But I ask you today, for you, is the cross enough? Does it really finish everything? And do we live as if it's true? I have plenty of conversations. I have had plenty of conversations over the years with people about what this cross means. I guess it goes with the territory of my calling. And a lot of these conversations seem to follow the same pattern. I speak about the cross and 
that the cross is all that we've got, the only thing we can lean on for life and salvation. And so many folks nod their heads in agreement with me and say, yes, pastor, I agree. Yes, I believe. I believe in the cross, but I, my question is, how come I don't feel it? How come I don't feel forgiven? Yes, pastor, I'm all for the cross, but surely we can't give everything to the cross. Surely God expects me to contribute. God expects me to do something as well. Or yes, I believe in the cross, but, you, but pastor, you don't know what I'm living with. You don't know what my guilt feels like. My guilt is too deep. My sin is too horrible. My shame is too strong. I am beyond forgiveness. It's all the same. Yes, but. Yes, but. Yes, but. I've got to keep this burden to myself. Yes, but. I've got to carry my own load. Yes, but. I've got to pull my own weight. Yes, Jesus died on the cross for the whole world, but for me, I'm not so sure. I've got to hang on to my fear about the future. I've got to get my life straightened out and offer God something useful. When we say yes, but to the cross, what we are saying is it isn't finished. It isn't complete. It isn't enough. Yes, but. There is no good news, friends, in these two words. And that's why the question is so important to ask the third time. Is it finished? See, now the question gets personal. In a moment, we're going to hear the story of the cross once again. And the point of today, the point of hearing the story again, is not just to hear it as a sad story and to feel bad for a few hours, to feel sorry for what Jesus had to go through, because Good Friday faith moves us somewhere else. We hear the story once again not to create some feeling or experience within ourselves. The Passion Gospel's job is to point to Jesus and Jesus alone. Yes, this morning we have confessed, we have admitted the sin we bear, the sin that moved God to journey to the cross. And now as we hear the story again, now is the time to turn our ears and eyes away from ourselves to see and hear what God is doing today. Now is the time to see and hear once again God, what God has done through the death of this man Jesus. Now is the time to look at this man Jesus, decked in thorns, wrapped in a mock royal robe, nailed to a cross. Now is the time to look at this humbled humanity. Now is the time to look with eyes of faith eyes of faith that can see what's really going on. Now is the time to see that this broken man has come from God and will soon return to God, having completed, finished God's saving work for the world and for you. In German, we call this day Karfreitag. And I've learned that the original translation from the old German is Hard Friday. That makes sense to me. This is a hard day. A hard day for us. It is a hard, it's hard to hear the story of this mystery. It is hard to witness again and with our ears this suffering being acted out again. But always, 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 the hardest part about today is looking at it all with the eyes of faith. The eyes of faith that can hear the story and say, look, the cross. The cross is for me. The cross is for me. So on Hard Friday, <clears throat> Good Friday, <clears throat> the hard questions confront us. <clears throat> questions like, why do I fear tomorrow? Why do I fear death? Why am I crippled with shame and guilt? Where did the cross go for me? Why do I still need to prove myself? What else am I clinging to? Why can't I let the cross be the cross for me? This hard Friday, we face the hardest question of all. Is the cross enough? Disciple, is the cross enough for you? Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. 
Nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Hear now the passion of our Lord. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. And then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, For whom are you looking? And they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. And when Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. And again he asked them, For whom are you looking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. And then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus, and Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? And so the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus, and since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate, and so the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out spoke to the woman who guarded the gate and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, you are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? And he said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing around it and warming themselves and Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. And the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. And Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. And when he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face saying, is that how you answer the high priest? And Jesus answered, if I've spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? And then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself, and they asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, well, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. And the Jews replied, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. And then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, my kingdom, my kingdom is not from this world. 
If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. And Pilate asked him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate asked him, what is truth? After he said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? And they shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head and they dressed him in a purple robe and they kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. And Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to, him, to them, Here is the man. And when the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? And Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. And from then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, here is your king. And they cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate asked them, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, we have no king but the emperor. And then he handed him over to them to be crucified. And so they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew was called Golgotha. And there they crucified him and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross, and it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. And then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the King of the Jews, but this man said, I am the King of the Jews. And Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. And when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic, and now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. And then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home after this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, I am thirsty. 
A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the others who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. Then things occurred so that the scriptures, these things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus, wrapped it with the spices and linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ.
Let us pray, brothers and sisters, for the Holy Church throughout the world. Almighty and eternal God, you have shown your glory to all nations in Jesus Christ. By your Holy Spirit, guide the Church and gather it throughout the world. Help it to persevere in faith, proclaim your name, and bring the good news of salvation in Christ to all people. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for our bishops, our pastors, all servants of the Church, and all the people of God. Almighty and eternal God, your Spirit guides the Church and makes it holy. Strengthen and uphold our bishops, pastors, other ministers, and lay leaders. Keep them in health and safety for the good of the Church, and help each of us in our various vocations to do faithfully the work to which you've called us. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for our sisters and brothers who share our faith in Christ. Almighty and eternal God, you give your church unity. Look with favor on all who follow Jesus, your Son. Make all the baptized one in the fullness of faith and keep us united in the fellowship of love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the Jewish people, the first to hear the word of God. Almighty and eternal God, long ago you gave your promise to Abraham and Sarah and your teaching to Moses. Hear our prayers that the people you called and elected as your own may receive the fulfillment of the covenant's promises. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not share our faith in Jesus Christ. Almighty and eternal God, gather into your embrace all those who call out to you under different names. Bring an end to interreligious strife. Make us more faithful witnesses of the love made known to us in your Son. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not believe in God. Almighty and eternal God, you created humanity so that all may long to know you and find peace in you. Grant that all may recognize the signs of your love and grace in the world and in the lives of Christians, and gladly acknowledge you as the one true God. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for God's creation. Almighty and eternal God, you are the creator of a magnificent universe. Hold all the worlds in the arms of your care and bring all things to fulfillment in you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who serve in public office. Almighty and eternal God, you are the champion of the poor and the oppressed. In your goodness, give wisdom to those in authority so that all people may enjoy justice, peace, freedom, and to share in the goodness of your creation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Let us pray for those in need. Almighty and eternal God, you give strength to the weary and new courage to those who have lost heart. Heal the sick, comfort the dying, give safety to travelers, free those unjustly deprived of liberty, deliver your world from falsehood, hunger, and disease. Hear the prayers of all who call on you in any trouble, that they may have the joy of receiving your help in their need. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Into your hands, O Lord, we commit all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Christ our Lord. Amen.
May the peace of Christ be with you all. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, whose suffering and death gave salvation to all. You gather your people around the tree of the cross, transforming death into life. And so with all the choirs of angels and all the, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Behold the living bread come down from heaven. Those who eat of it will never die. Behold the cup of eternal life. Those who drink of it will live forever. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, in a wonderful sacrament, you strengthen us with the saving power of your suffering, death, and resurrection. May this sacrament of your body and blood so work in us that the fruits of your redemption will show forth in the way we live. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Were you there when they nailed him 
to the tree. me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified Marie? Were you there when they pierced him in the side? Were you there it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they pierced him in the side? We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you. We adore you, O Christ, and we bless you.